Hi, we are back at Indie Film Festival Pitch Rally 2019. I am so excited watching these filmmakers pitch their film to the judges. And they are having a wonderful time. Well, we got much more to come, so sit back while we continue watching filmmakers pitch their films. Next contestant is Christian Lucas from Louisville, Kentucky. Hello. Hello. I want to personally thank uh, Indy Memphis for having all of us here. And I mean, just listen to all of your projects. I'm so lucky to be in the room with you all. All right, so I am Christian Loria Lucas, and yes, I'm from Louisville, Kentucky, but I was born and raised right here in Memphis, Tennessee. So, go White Naked Tigers. <laughs> um, I, well, who am I? I am a writer, I am a mom, I'm a wife, I'm a graduate student at the University of Louisville, and when I'm not busy working or taking care of family, I write stories. I'm a short fiction writer. And now I'm dabbing into screenplays. Let It Be Me is uh, my first feature length screenplay that I'm working on. Um, it is a story simply about love. Now, what would you say is the greatest love story of all time? Now, most experts will tell you Romeo and Juliet or any Jane Austen novel, uh, The Great Gatsby, The Notebook. We all had to read about these stories in school, in our college classes. But what do they all have in common? They are stories told from the white perspective. These are the stories that are pushed through the literary canon and the film canon. And historically, those canons have excluded black voices and black narratives. I love a good story, but I know that Jane Austen did not write her stories for someone who looks like me. I want to write stories for people who look like me. And here are some examples of beautiful love stories written by black writers. And you can't talk about a love film without talking about love and basketball, and also Moonlight. Yeah. I wrote Let It Be Me because I wanted to see that type of story, first of all, in a short story fiction, and then on film. Let It Be Me is unique because the characters aren't so unique. It is a coming of age story about a little girl and a little boy growing up in Como, Mississippi. They live below the poverty line. They live in a trailer park. Shauna lives with her grandmother, and Beanie lives with his abusive father. Shauna inevitably, inevitably falls in love with her best friend, Beanie, but she soon learns that the weight of love is a heavy burden for someone to bear. I did publish this story first on neomagazine.com, then it was published again, um, in Midnight Indigo, a literary journal for female writers. Now, that's me in the red. <laughs> and this is the director of this film, Raphael Baker, and I were both born and raised here in Memphis, South Memphis to be exact. He is my favorite cousin, but don't tell his little sister. <laughs> I love her too. Raphael Baker is currently a photographer, a fashion photographer here in Memphis, and he also does work in Atlanta. You have actually seen some of his photographs on billboards around the city. He's also a, manage, a manager, pro, a project manager for uh, City Gear, where he also directs a lot of their commercials that you've seen on TV. Now, this won't be our first project together. This is literally us in our grandmother's house in South Memphis, Riverside. Um, we were shooting scenes from a poetry book that I'd written back in 2011. Now, we didn't know what the hell we were doing, but we had so much fun just being together and creating together and telling these stories. Now, Como, Mississippi is 45 minutes away from Memphis, and most of the story takes place in Mississippi. But we know that we can film most of the film here in Memphis. And we are lucky because we have relatives both here and in Mississippi. Uh, so we have access to tons of private properties and businesses owned by our very own relatives. So with a budget of $150,000, that is going to help us cut down on a lot of costs because our family loves us. Um, but we still need some help. We're, I'm definitely new to filmmaking. Raphael has been building his skills over the years. Um, but we're going to look for our cast right here in Memphis, and we're also going to expand that search to 
throughout Tennessee and the Mississippi. Um, we also are going to look for crew here. We're going to need help producing this. Uh, we're going to want someone with experience, and also we're going to need mentors. Because again, we want to get the best advice, we want to get suggestions, and we're always open to learning something new. Uh, we know that love is not exclusively a white experience. It's a human experience. And I want to tell a black love story. Now, the experts may say Romeo and Juliet is the greatest love story of all time, but we want to give them two other names, Shauna and Beanie. Two black kids that look just like me, who just simply fall in love. Thank you. Another black spot. Miss Sid Stewart, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you so much. Um, I want to give a shout out to Mary Jenkins and Miriam Bale. Um, because of them, I'm here, and to all the filmmakers I've met over the weekend, I think I'm going to move to Memphis. Yeah. Yeah. Deep calls into deep, and trauma turns into purpose. A silent voice becomes loud, wrote a story about a girl, somebody's child left behind. Wrote a song, because she deserves a redemption song. And everybody can be black girl magic strong. Our stories are not tragedies. God makes beauty from ashes. As humans, you and I, we hurt, we heal, we feel, but we rise. Show of hands, any humans in the audience? <laughs> Hi, my name is Sid Stewart, and I'm a filmmaker, and my story is about the system, how the system keeps us on lock, um, the foster care system, the mental health care system, and the criminal justice system, it re-traumatizes, and it strips young people of their self-worth, their dignity, and their humanity. So Deep is a motion picture anthem because survivors are sheroes. Deep is a love story. It's a love anthem. It's a voice for the silent ones, the incarcerated ones, the ones I work with in South Harlem and LA um, from, from an organization I founded called Better Youth. It's about breaking the cycles, uh, the cycles of trauma, hopelessness, um, um, hopelessness and abuse. It speaks to the spirit of resiliency. These are the young people I work with. Uh, the lead character embodies our shared experiences. Her story is our story. Um, this project was inspired by a documentary I wrote and directed called Super Shiro. It's from a poem I wrote in my second book. So this is not a victim story, but an opportunity to inspire hope and courage in young audiences. Again, this is from Super Shiro. Um, I'm inspired by young people and what they do, and they respond to stories about them. So basically, this story is Black Girl Magic on Steroids. It's about a young girl named Mona, 21-year-old, who, um, while participating in a state rehab program, she is violated for the last time and musters the courage to uh, fight her demons. The story unfolds when she arrives at the Miriam Center um, on a bus from a Tennessee prison. She's restrained by armed guards and she misses the orientation spiel by Dr. Phillips, uh, the founder of uh, Miriam Center, who becomes her worst nightmare. She befriends Miss Q, a former resident and staff member who encourages her to fight and to write. She introduces Mona to Xavier, uh, an ambitious law student, who walks on her journey um, that leads to a public court case. In the end, Mona learns to turn her trauma into purpose. This is about medical harm. This is about righting your wrongs. It's deeply personal because my mother was a survivor. I watched her as a child overcome mental health challenges. Um, there's a Mona in every community, every city, and there's a Mona in Memphis. So it's similar to films we know, but with a twist, because it's leaning towards being a thriller. Um, I believe that this film could work well on streaming, net, uh, streaming platforms like Netflix and Amazon. Um, as an actress, I've featured in projects on HBO and Stars. Um, I was born at the New Eureka Poets Cafe in New York. I was on BET, Deaf Poetry Unplugged. Um, but my greatest work is with youth. I help them produce films. We produce a global youth film festival that reaches youth in 52 countries and territories using social media, fostering youth, making films. Um, why Memphis? As I said, I want to strengthen the um, Memphis to Hollywood pipeline. Um, 
And we want to host, we want to hire, we want to cast, and we want to find a Mona here. We want to work with Youth Villages. It's a local nonprofit that has national recognition for working with youth in, in care. Um, we have some people attached that want to plant in this community. These are my friends, Pete Chapman, Edwina, and John Tenney. Um, we want to plant in this community. Um, our budget is ambitious, so we want to win this $10,000. Yes, Christy Taylor. <laughs> locations, but when you come to the M-Town, when you come to the big city, you somebody. And that's what my characters are. They came from this mythical place about 45 minutes away called Maplesville that has a deep, dark secret. But they came to Memphis High School and college sweethearts made good. Matter of fact, Nora, she is a socialite. Her husband was a black guy, makes six figures as a political uh, strategist. However, He's out here cheating like a lot of folk do. Y'all know the M-Town, come on now. And she takes to drinking. The voice ain't pretty, it ain't pretty, but you know, she got her Jack Daniels, she got her youngins. But most important, she finds herself when, over at the Botanic Garden, she takes up a class. And it's there that she reconnects to her hometown and starts planting tomatoes, tomatoes to be exact. Farmer Marcus galore, she all throughout the region making it happy, and that's when she meets Jimmy Lee with his pickup truck. Now, Jimmy Lee ain't just any ordinary type of person. He's a white man. More importantly, he's a redneck. Anybody know any rednecks around him? Okay, I'm trying to get my best redneck on. How than ever, Memphis and Maplesville are two different areas. Ain't you no know, race mixing out this way. However, the love has to go against the grain. They have to overcome trying to find love in Trump's America. No hate, y'all. No hate. Just telling a story. Just trying to tell a story. And it's at this point when love and hate collides that they have to fight for what they want. Now, I know I said jokingly that I'm a middle-aged woman who likes younger men, and I, that's part of it. But more importantly, I'm from D.C., mama born in Mississippi, raised in West Tennessee, and I understand that in Memphis, there's a duality where racism divides and unites us. Our bragging rights are actually the fact that we overcome Amazing art, our grit sparks our grind. Who am I? Just a chick who's a creator, who's written a couple movies, who's toured the country, who skydives, who has records and books. And I have 40 years worth of life. I can't put it in five minutes, y'all. <laughs> As a matter of fact, this is the hardest part of this whole story to talk about myself and why I should make it. Tomato and Memphis is a delicious pairing because Memphis is full of great stories, like our songs, y'all. And I just want to kind of add my little flavor in the cinematic world so that as I launch my film career, because Life After Radio Part 2, y'all, um, is going to bring me to a place where I get a chance to do in film what I did in radio. And for those who know me, y'all know I'm about that life, about being a collaborator. So a micro budget, 250 grand, using every connection I have across this country, mainly in Memphis. But $10,000 will help us do an amazing story concept Utilizing all my connects in the city, Princeton, uh-huh. <laughs> and everybody who loves me. Do I have anybody who loves me in the city? Yeah! Okay. So y'all already know we're gonna help make this movie, right? But here it is. Christy Taylor Online is where you're gonna find me on all my social media. This was crazy, and I'm glad it's over. I love y'all back. <laughs> so, my name is Nubia, and I'm a multidisciplinary artist that is my daddy. Yeah. So, a few facts about my dad are that he was born in Southside Chicago. He's the oldest of five siblings. He went to Simeon High, which is the same high school as Michelle Obama, but they didn't go there at the same time. Um, he went to college, he got a degree in education, he wanted to be a history teacher. Um, and when my dad was about 20 years old, uh, he went to prison for possession with intent to sell. So, ask yourself, if the first thing I had told you about my dad was that he was a felon, how would that have affected the way you receive him? Keep that in mind as I go through my pitch. So, the name of my movie is See Jane Run. And See Jane Run is a dark comedy, which is sometimes surreal, and it is told in three vignettes, uh, See Jane Run. Uh, I borrowed the title from a well-known children's book series, Born with Dick and Jane, which got criticized a lot for its lack of diversity and representation, and so I chose this title subversively. 
Every second of CJ run is spent trying to shine a light on segments of black lives that are often tossed to wayside. Um, it critiques our criteria for morality and good and bad people and how that criteria is often thin. Kind of like how a lot of you would have a really negative image of my dad in your head if all you knew about him was that he had been in prison. So, the first vignette, C, follows three baby cousins, Woo Woo, Red, and Cherish. So they're supposed to be getting watched by their oldest cousin, Rodney, but he's not doing a good job because he's distracted by some young lady in his room who is not his girlfriend. And so, the baby cousins decide that today is the day they embark on the journey. So in this neighborhood, there's an urban legend that the blind old candy lady is secretly a kingpin. <laughs> and so they say today, we've been to figure out if the rumors are true. And so, uh, while they're having a the grand old time playing detective, um, they find that the answer might cost them a little more than a routine ask yeah. um, The second vignette, Jane, follows Jane and Rodney from the last uh, vignette. So they're in love, or whatever. Um, but there's some trouble in paradise because, you know, when they first started dating, Rodney was just like a regular weed man, but he's graduated from weed to weight, and so now he oh. makes a little more money and he don't got a lot of time for Jane anymore, so they argue, um, and she flushes his drugs down the toilet, um, and they both might die. The third vignette follows Freddie, <laughs> who uh, is a bum ass nigga, but he got a good heart. Um, and he prefers uh, odd jobs to nine to fives, and so we follow him throughout his day, and fixing sinks and mowing lawns. And all the while, he's telling everybody who will listen how good life is, when he's been clean for a year, money's good, and he's finally going to get to have dinner with his daughter Jane, who he hasn't seen since she was really little. Um, but in the end, we find there's like a twist, and it's kind of heart wrenching. Um, but anyway, I'm going way too, okay, this, I'm going to skip. So, why this film? Oh my goodness. Alright, it's fine. Um, so, these are, these are screenshots from projects that I've made before. Me and my team, we make films with shoestring budgets. Um, we pour over every detail, we stay up late, um, we lose our mind on set, and we pay out of pocket, and we do all this because we love film. And I think that it's time for that love to finally be well funded. Um, $10,000 $10, we pay for us to rig equipment to make the film look every bit as beautiful as we would love for it to be. Yes. This is examples of how we would like the film to look. Um, second, this film would allow us to submit this film uh, to every film festival we can find so that it gets the widest audience possible. And third, and this is the one that is heaviest on my heart, I would get to finally pay my friends for their brilliance. Yeah. My team so, so smart, so good, so talented, and so hardworking, and we do all of this off our own dime, and we don't have any money. And I think that a salary is something that they deserve, at the very least. And while we're on the topic of things that people deserve, um, I'm going to go back to my dad real quick. So, I think my dad uh, deserved more from life. I think um, that he has big dreams, still has big dreams to this day, and he hasn't been able to realize a lot of them simply because the world judges him as a throwaway, and I don't think that's fair. And the least that I can do is, that's a favorite picture of him, he hates it. Um, <laughs> the least that I can do is try to tell his story, and CJ Run is just one of the ways that I want to tell that story. See, this $10,000 is not just for me, it ain't even just for my team, it's for my dad, for his story, and stories like his. Thank you. $10,000 prize will not be announced today. <laughs> it will be announced tomorrow night at 9.30 p.m. So we're going to keep you on pins and needles for um, about another 36 hours, I guess. And uh, it will be announced Saturday night across the street at the Playhouse on the square. Right here. I'm sorry, on this side. This side. Okay? Winners, one of you all sitting right here, or a couple of you all sitting right here, the production must begin in where? Memphis! I can't hear that. Memphis! Memphis, Tennessee by August 1st, 2020. Okay? All right. To receive the $10,000 prize, all pitch contestants will have industry speed meetings on tomorrow to build their support networks. So if you saw a project or two or three or four or five or six or seven or eight, 
and I have about 15 and I can give you as well, well please come out and support those projects. All right, and everyone join us outside at 5 p.m. for the block party reception and see the unapologetic show. Is he here? He's outside saying no. Okay. Uh, the show starts at 8.30 at the block party. So, again, thank you all for coming out. Thank Ryan Watt, Andy Memphis, the Pepper Center, and thank all our contestants for being able to come out. Thank you. Ooh, we are back, and I hope you enjoyed that, how they pitched their film, because I know I did. Yes, I really had a wonderful time, and I'm excited about going forward with pitching a film of my own. Now we're going to go out here to the block party. We're going to talk with some more people out there out there at the block party because they're having a good time. So I hope you enjoy all of this here. Because like I said, in the coming weeks, we're going to bring you more and more in-depth information because Indie Film Festival, like I said, is doing a wonderful job. Yes, so come on, let's go out.